Okay, I want to go ahead and apologize because the quality of this is not going to be great. Um, I'm sitting in my car and it's dark out. Um, Josiah is in basketball practice for the next hour or so. This is like the only time that I have that's alone and quiet where I can do stuff like this. But I wanted to come on tonight and talk about Esther. I would have done a live stream, but like my connection is usually really spotty and it cuts out. So I figured this way it'll like record. Hopefully there's enough space on my phone that I can get through the whole video without having to piece it together later. Um, but Esther was my absolute favorite story growing up. I could tell it to you right now just from my memory because I had my mom read it to me every day, every night for years. Like I've probably had her read this to me hundreds of times. And to this day, when anyone talks about Esther, I can picture like the pictures that were in my children's storybook when I was a kid. And I remember the pictures of the feast and like them eating chicken legs um, and like cartoon pictures and her pointing her finger at Haman. Um, I, I remember all of it. And so I could definitely give you like my summary and synopsis of the story, but I wanted to go a little bit deeper tonight. So I studied the book again and I took notes and I pretty much wrote the entire book of Esther in my notebook. I don't even know. I think it's like almost 30 pages that I wrote. Um, just taking notes. It's, I could almost like just read you the book of Esther and it would be almost equivalent to my notes because I wrote down so much, but that's really how I learned things is by reading and kind of taking notes and writing things down, um, and like kind of regurgitating it. So that sounded gross. Sorry. So anyways, um, sorry, I have notes. I'm just kind of looking at, um, so as I've gotten older, one thing that really sticks out to me is just like her wisdom, her courage, her bravery, and her patience to be able to sit at the table with your enemy and prepare them food, knowing that they are plotting your family's demise, that they're trying to destroy you. Um, and, and preparing and serving them food day after day while biting your tongue. That is a level of self-control that I don't know that I possess. Um, I don't know many people that, sorry, I'm going to put my armrest down so that I can balance the phone because this will probably be a while. But um, yeah, I don't know many people that possess that level of self-control. That is a supernatural level of self-control to sit quietly and bless those plotting to destroy you and trusting that God will fight for you and having just the bravery to do that, especially in that time period, because, um, you know, just the whole story, like she, even being the queen did not have a right to go before the king and she could have been killed doing that. We'll get to that later, but like, there's just so much bravery in this story and it's my absolute favorite Bible story. And there have been times in my life where, you know, I'll hear that verse, like, perhaps you were made for such a time as this. And it's never been anything that would like risk my life. Maybe like my reputation or what people will think of me or upset some people. But it's never been like such a severe instance, like, like in Esther's time. But yet it's such, it's so encouraging to think of this story, to use it as the fuel for bravery, to be obedient to God. You know, she said, if I perish, I perish. And, um, just what kind of faith that is that you're willing to sacrifice yourself and your own life for the greater good of your people. And this is just a foreshadowing of Jesus, her whole life. And so, um, just talking about, you know, how she's sitting quietly and blessing Haman. And this goes on for days. And I just, I, um, I admire Esther so much for this because I have a hard time not popping off at the mouth with a rude comment when someone slightly disrespects me. I can't hardly bite my tongue for more than 10 seconds. Um, I always have something to say. I always have to have the last word. And yet this man had plotted to kill her and her entire family. 
and she sat quietly and waited on the Lord. And so this is something that I'm still learning. This has been my favorite story my entire life, and I know it's because there's so much that I have to learn here and to unpack here. Um, Proverbs 26, 27 says, A fool sets a trap and falls into it himself. And we see this happen with Haman, and we'll get to it later, but just, um, just to kind of give you a little bit, some of you probably know the story very well. Some of you maybe have never heard it before, and I think I take that for granted a lot. Um, I just assume that everyone grew up like I did, like grew up in Sunday school, heard all the stories, like they've taught them things. Um, but I had a friend a few years ago that was like, hey, I keep seeing all this stuff on Pinterest that's like, be an Esther, be a Deborah. Like, who is Esther? Can you tell me about her? And, um, you know, sometimes when we go to other countries or um, or ministering in, in other countries, we assume that like maybe they've never heard the gospel before in a third world country because it is rare there. But we assume that because we're in America that everyone knows Jesus, that everyone knows the Bible stories, and that's not the truth. There's a lot of people in America that have never heard the gospel. They don't know that Jesus came as their savior and took the price on the cross that we deserved. The Bible says the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God, but the gift of God is um, eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. I feel like I might have butchered that verse, but you can look it up. The wages of sin is death. And um, so we deserve to die, but Jesus came and took the price and paid for our, our sins and paid the price and died when he had never sinned so that we don't have to, so that we can live in eternity with him one day, that we're not damned here uh, to hell, that we can actually be reunited with God one day, that we can be reconciled. And so, so this verse in Proverbs, a fool sets a trap and falls into it himself. You know, we see this happen with Haman when he's hung on the very same gallows that he made for Mordecai. And if you don't know the story, I'm going to get to all of it in just a minute. But like, let's just talk about the wisdom here in the book of Esther. So like, what was her first response when she found out the news that Haman had devised this plan to kill all the Jews? She asked those close to her to pray and fast for three days. She said, don't eat or drink anything for three days. Pray to the Lord with me. She commanded Mordecai and all the Jews to do the same. The servants that were in her, um, in her home and that worked for the, for the kingdom that were her servants. She asked all these people close to her to pray and seek the Lord. And so her first step when she receives devastating news is to seek the Lord, not to devise a plan in her own strength, but to seek God's will for what he would have her do. And I mean, how many times do we, do we just run and vent and call our best friend and be like, you're not going to believe what these people are trying to do. You know, they made this plan to destroy me and all of this stuff. She didn't seek other people's opinions. She didn't run her mouth. She didn't come up with her own plan. She sought the Lord on what he would have her do. There is so much wisdom here that we should all learn from. And she fasted. Um, and so... There's also so much courage here because after the three days, um, you know, she approaches the king. And if you don't have, if you're not like summoned or have permission to go to the king, you can be killed just for approaching him without permission. So not only was that courageous, but she then goes on to expose herself as a Jew, knowing that it could cost her her life. Um, the bravery to sit at the table with your enemy while treating them with kindness and grace and respect, feeding them, serving them for two days before announcing that she had an issue with him. You know, she didn't just invite him over, call him up on the phone and go off on him. She served him quietly for two days before she pointed the finger at him and said, this man's come against my family. Um, this is something we also see Jesus model for us later with Judas. This is how we treat our enemies. Jesus sat and 
fed Judas and blessed him and washed his feet and broke bread with him, knowing that he would betray him. So we pray for our enemies, we bless them, and we do good for them. That's what we're called to do. And that is so, it so goes against our flesh. When someone offends you, when someone disrespects you, when someone does something to you or your family, the last thing you want to do is pray for them, bless for them, bless them, or do good to them. But that's what we're called to do. And this is what Jesus models. And this is what Esther models here. Um, and God will not be mocked. And the truth will always be revealed. So um, I had some notes just about the book of Esther. My Bible is like a study Bible. And um, so Pur Pur Purim, Puram, I think it's Puram, is the Jewish holiday. Uh, cel it's a celebration of deliverance. And we'll, we'll get to all of this later, but this is just kind of like the summary of kind of what's going to go on in this book. Um, it's also similar to Joseph in the court of the Egyptian Pharaoh and Daniel in the court of Babylon, each about a Jew who was delivered from a death plot and rose to a high position in a pagan government. Jesus came first for the Jews and then to the Gentiles to deliver us from death and rise to a higher position with, with him. This is symbolic of Jesus. God is never absent and appears um, so, okay, so the book of Esther, um, this is what my study Bible said. I've never heard anyone say this before, but in the Bible, this actually appears to be like a secular book, which I believe that everything in the Bible is like the, the word of God, that it was inspired by God and that it's meant to be in the Bible. But there is actually like no mention of God in this book. And it's actually written as like a historical context. Like they weren't writing it to put it in the Bible. Um, it was written as history. Um, so it's really neat because if you look on like other history books, you'll see like the same Kings like Xerxes, um, and stuff in, in the history books. And so this is, a, this was just like the history of this time period. And like, even the Kings, they have like things written down in their royal books. That stuff is all there today. I don't know where it is or how you'd find it, but like the records, there's a record of this stuff. This is history. This is true. Um, the entire Bible is true, but like, this is like, it's just the history of this kingdom. Okay. So, um, and it's a, it's about God's chosen people. This is a redemptive history. It's, uh, God's power to work even through pagans to preserve and deliver his people. We see the same thing in Exodus. The enemies of God's people cannot prevail over his purposes, even when God himself seems strangely absent. The destiny of God's people will not be determined by anything other than the purposes of God himself. I just want to say that again. The destiny of God's people will not be determined by anything other than the purposes of God himself. So Esther, if you look in Greek history, there's Xerxes. His reign is from um, 486 to 465 BC. This occurred during the time of King Xerxes. Xerxes reigned in Susa, which is now Iran. It's near its border with Iraq. In the third year of his reign, he had a banquet for all his nobles and officials and military leaders and princes. All the people of Susa, from least to greatest, were in, closed in the garden at the banquet. So everyone is there. And my handwriting is super bad. <laughs> so let me see what this says. Uh... Oh, I'm sorry. Wine was served in gold goblets. Everyone was allowed to drink with no restrictions. So they're having this banquet. And meanwhile, Queen Vashti, which is King Xerxes' wife, um, also had a banquet for the women in the royal palace. And so on the last day of the banquet, the king commands his employees and eunuchs to bring the queen to display her beauty to the people. And she pridefully refuses to come. She's like, I'm a queen. I'm not going to be 
you know, just like displayed for my beauty and gawked at. And I'm, I'm busy like having my own banquet. I'm not coming. And so this made the king furious and he burned with anger. And the people start to say things like, if your queen and your wife won't even respect you or honor you, how are our wives going to respect and honor us? Because this, she's setting an example and there's going to be a rebellion in the kingdom and our wives won't even listen to us. And so they suggest that, um, that, okay, I'll get to it. So it says, according to the law, what must be done to Queen Vashti? And the wise men said, the queen's conduct would get out and all the women would respond to the king's nobles the same way. There will be no end of disrespect and discord, which is kind of what I just said. Um, therefore, issue a royal decree for her to be banished from the king and her royal position be given to someone else who is better than she. So this is all just like notes straight out of my Bible. Like I was just writing almost word for word the story. Um, and it's really interesting. I think sometimes people think the Bible is like boring or hard to understand. I think mine is the New Living Translation. And um, it's it's not hard to understand. But I mean, these stories are just incredible and you can learn so much from them. And so if you think that the Bible is intimidating or hard to understand, I just want to encourage you to press in and read it and ask God to give you wisdom to understand it and to open your eyes um, for understanding. And, um, I think you'll get so much out of it. I just want to say that. So anyways, so the wise man, the wise men concluded that what Queen Vashti had done was wrong for two reasons. One, she dis she disobeyed the commands of the king, her husband. She also set a poor example to other women by her disobedience and rebelliousness. They said, then all the women will respect their husbands. Oh, okay, okay. So, when they heard of the punishment for Queen Vashti's disobedience, which was going to be that, like, she was going to be banned um, from, from the king, banished, so she could not enter his presence again, and he was, like, divorcing her, and he was going to find a new queen. And it says, when they, um, when everyone hears of the punishment, then all the women will respect their husbands from the least to the greatest. Like they were using this as an example to kind of invoke like a godly fear almost to submit and honor their husbands. And so um, they sent dispatches proclaiming every man shall be the ruler of his own household. So they sent these messengers in every language, every tongue around, and they're um, decreeing like this new law. Um, there's going to be people that are upset by this message that like a man should rule over a woman. And honestly, for a long time, I was one of them. Um, but I actually realized now the beauty here of godly submission. I'm such a people pleaser. I'm awful at saying no or making quick decisions. And so anytime I'm asked to do anything, my immediate knee jerk response is to say yes. Sometimes when our schedule is busy and I'm asked to do several things, I'll ask my husband because I'm just looking for him to say no, because then it's final. Sorry, we can't. I talked to Kevin. We're too busy. Won't be able to make it. But if he doesn't give me any clear directions, I will ponder it for days and stress myself out, trying to figure out how to possibly do it all. By submitting to his headship, it actually takes so much stress and pressure off of me and relieves my anxiety. It's a beautiful thing to have a man that leads our family well and hears from God and can give wise advice and direction to your home. It brings peace and order. So then, basically, the king's attendants throw this huge beauty pageant with beautiful young virgins for the king to select a new wife. And they are brought in from every province. We're back to the story of Esther. I was just giving you a little snippet about my life. Um, I really struggled with submission for a long time, and now I absolutely crave it. I hate having to make big decisions, um, no matter what it is. And so, 
sometimes it's just nice for someone to like tell you what to do. Like, I don't know if I should do this. I don't know if I should take this job. And like Kevin is really good about, he doesn't just like boss me around or take uh, advantage of the fact that like he's the head of our home. Um, he's always like very supportive of whatever I want to do. He's like, you know, if that's what you want to do, we'll do it. But sometimes I don't know. I don't know what the right decision is. And I'm just like, just tell me what you think I should do. And he doesn't always tell me a lot of times he's kind of like, Oh, whatever you think. But I'm like, I need you to lead me. I actually want that for a long time. I never thought I wanted that. Um, but now I do. It's like something that I crave is like, I want you to lead our home. So they throw this beauty pageant there. They're all given beauty treatments. Sorry. I'm trying to balance this. That's really blurry. Um, and then the king is to choose one to be his wife. So Mordecai, the Jew, carried into exile from Jerusalem by King Nebuchadnezzar. He had a cousin named Hadassah who he raised because she was an orphan. Um, so Esther is a Babylonian name. And Hadassah was a Hebrew name. And because the Jews were like kind of hated at this time, he didn't want them to know that she was a Jew. And so he gave her a Babylonian name and told her to conceal the fact that she was Jewish. Um, Esther was entr entrusted to uh, Haggai, Haggai, I don't remember how to say his name, Haggai, uh, the king's attendant, and she won favor with him. She did not reveal her nationality and family background because Mordecai had told her not to. Before a woman could go to the king's Xerxes, she had to complete one year of beauty treatments. So they did like perfumes and oils, six months of oil and myrrh, and six months of perfumes and cosmetics. She would see the king in the evening and in the morning, return to the care of, this literally looks like it says, uh, Sasquatch, Sasquatch, but it doesn't, uh, I think it's, I don't know if that's a G or a Q, Sashgaz or Sashclaws, I'm, look it up, I don't know what chapter we're in, Esther, anyways, it's one of, like, the king's workers, it's definitely not Sasquatch, but it's, like, I think it's S-H-A-A-S-S-H, it's either G-A-S or I think it's a G. Shashgaz. Shashgaz. Sh mm, don't know. So she sees the king in the evening. In the morning, she returns to the care of the king's worker, whose name we don't know how to pronounce. Um, and he was in charge of the king's concubines. She would not return to the king unless summoned by name. When it was Esther's turn, they were allowed to take anything they wanted to, the king, and she only took what Haggai suggested. She won the favor of everyone who saw her. The king was attracted to her more than anyone else, so he made her the queen and gave her a crown. Um, I remember like in my children's Bible, and even in the regular Bible, it talks about how when Esther gets there, you know, all the other girls are kind of like picking out what they want to wear, what they like, and she goes to the king's servant that knows the king. And she's like, what will he prefer? Like, what does he like? And she's asking this guy's opinion so that she can be pleasing to the king. Like, this is, there's so much wisdom throughout this entire thing. Uh, she's not somebody that just does things on a whim, that does whatever she wants. Um, everything she does is with intention and purpose and is done well. And so... Um, the king gives this great banquet, banquet, Esther's banquet, and proclaimed a holiday throughout the provinces and distributed gifts with royal liberty. Perhaps the banquet she held was to rekindle and the king's memory of this event and his great joy and love for her. So <coughs> if you don't know the story of Esther, um, we're getting to that, but the, the king has this banquet after he chooses her as his wife, and it's called Esther's Banquet, and he, procl he proclaims it as a holiday throughout all the provinces. He distributes gifts with royal liberty. And so later in the story, she has a banquet. She invites the king and Haman, and she's going to reveal at the end of this that 
Haman is plotting to kill her family and ask the king to do something about it. And I, while I was reading this, I just thought, like, perhaps the reason that she had a banquet like that was almost to remind the king of the banquet that he threw for her um, when he first found her and fell in love with her, um, to remind the king of this event and the great joy and his love for her, like when he first found her. Um, also, you know, the key to a man's heart is through his stomach. So if you're going to ask him to save your life, then feed him first. But this is also similar to Jesus. Um, you know, when Jesus, I mean, when Peter denies Jesus three times, they're by a fire. And then after Jesus resurrects and is, you know, walking around and stuff, he sets a scene and he sets a fire and he's cooking them breakfast and he invites them over and he asks Peter three times, do you love me? And he's reminding him of when he denied him um, so that he could redeem and restore him. So I feel like this could be symbolic. Um, she's almost reminding the king of his love for her in this banquet that he threw later on. So we have... Um, Queen Esther versus Queen Vashti. King, uh, Queen Esther obeyed Mordecai's instruction even as adult, even as an adult, and Vashti wanted to do her own thing and rebelled. So Queen Esther was a woman of submission. She was always submitting to those in authority over her. Um, Mordecai, even though it was her cousin, when her parents died, he took her in as like to raise her. And so this was like a father figure to her. And she obeyed his instruction and trusted in his wisdom. And she did everything that he told her to do, like not reveal her nationality or to change her name. Whereas King Vashti was just like doing her own thing. She didn't think that she had to listen to anybody else. Um, so there's a difference here in these two types of women. Sorry, I'm so thirsty. Um, so Mordecai, uh, there's one day Mordecai hears these two of the king's officers planning to assassinate King Xerxes. And he tells Esther about it. And so Esther goes, um, she tells the king and she gives Mordecai the credit for saving his life. And so the report was investigated and they found it to be true. Those two officials were impaled on poles and it was recorded in the book of uh, Annals in the presence of the king. So there was like this book that was basically like what takes place in the, the king's daily life. And sometimes when he can't sleep, he'll have it read to him. Like this was their TV. They didn't have entertainment. They didn't have, you know, whatever. Sometimes if he couldn't sleep, he would just hear the stories of what's happened in his kingship. So it's recorded in this book. Later, Haman's given a seat of honor above all of the other nobles. The king commanded the royal officials to bow down and pay honor to Haman, but Mordecai refused. So Mordecai serves God, and he's not going to bow to any man. And um, the royal officials questioned why Mordecai disobeyed the king's orders, and they told Haman that Mordecai was a Jew, and Haman was outraged that Mordecai would not pay him honor or bow to him. So Haman starts looking for a way to kill all of Mordecai's people, all the Jews. He knows that they serve God, that they're not going to bow to him or give him the honor that he thinks he respects. And so he wanted to destroy all of the Jews throughout the whole kingdom of Xerxes. So here we see that Haman was a type of Antichrist. So is Hitler. They are trying to destroy the Lord's people. And ultimately, Jesus... You know, when they, um, when King Herod ordered for all of the, you know, babies like two and under to be killed, he was trying to kill Jesus. This is a type of Antichrist. So Haman went to the king and told him, there's a certain people who keep themselves separate. Their customs are different from those of all the other people, and they do not obey the king's laws. I absolutely love this verse. I could read it like 10 times, but I won't. But there is a certain people who keep themselves separate from the world. Their customs are different from those of all the other people, and they do not obey the king's laws. So I think this just gives us like a clear picture of what we should look like as Christians. Like we are called to obey the laws of the land to a certain extent. 
when the law demands you to defy God, then you no longer are subject to the law. So when Nebuchadnezzar made a law for everyone to bow to his statue, that was not biblical. So God is the greater law, and we are required to follow that law. Even though the law of the land said to, to do this, the Bible says to have no other God before me. So they're trying to make a God of these things, of these idols, of these people, and bow to them. And they said, we will not bow. And that's what we should be. We should be a certain type of people who keep themselves separate from the world, whose customs are different from all the other people. We should look different from the world. We shouldn't bow at the things that the world bows at. Um, and so he proposed a decree to destroy them and promised 10,000 talents of silver to the king's administrators for the royal treasury. I wanted to look up how much money that actually was, and I didn't get to. So if you have a minute, look that up. How much was 10,000 talents of silver back then? This was like 486 BC during King Xerxes. Um, I'm just curious how much money that was back then. You know, Jesus was betrayed for like 30 shekels of silver. So I'm just curious how much this actually is. But he's he's like proposing to the king a plan to destroy all of the Jews. And he's promising to pay 10,000 talents of silver to the king's administrators for the royal treasury. The king takes his signet ring and gives it to Haman. Cannot flip the page. There we go. And says, keep the money and do with the people as you please. So dispatches were sent to all the provinces with the order to kill, destroy, and annihilate the Jews. So kill and destroy. We know that the devil comes to kill, steal, and destroy. So this is just like completely demonic. This is Haman's plan to kill all of God's people. And I just feel like anytime you see those words like kill, steal, and destroy, you know this is like an attack from the enemy. And history will repeat itself because the enemy's not smart. He doesn't come up with new plans. How many times have in history have people tried to kill the Jews? There's a reason for this. There's a reason this has happened in history. You all have heard about Hitler. There is a reason that the Jews have been like targeted so many times because they're God's people. And Satan hates that and he's trying to wipe them out. This is history. It's repeating itself. I think it's so neat. I used to not like history. I couldn't keep up with all the dates. I didn't really care. I found it boring. But the more that you go into the Word of God, it's so interesting, and it's history. And you can see when you read the Bible, like how everything in the world today makes sense. You understand why there's tension in the Middle East because of Abraham's sons, Isaac and Ishmael. Like if you really study the word of God, it explains everything that's going on in the world today and where all the tension came from. So I'm so sorry. I'm so thirsty. Let's see. So they sent out dispatches to all the provinces with the order to kill, destroy, and annihilate all the Jews, the young and old women and children on a single day, the 13th of the 12th month. And plunder their goods. Okay, so there's the other word, steal. The devil comes to kill, steal, and destroy. So not only did he order them to kill, destroy, and annihilate them, but also to steal everything they had. This is just a complete plot of the enemy here. This is Satan's work here that Haman's trying to carry out with this decree he's made. And so a copy of this text was issued as law in every province and made known to the people of every nationality so they would be ready for that day. When Mordecai learned of this, he tore his clothes, put on sackcloth and ashes, and went out to the city wailing bitterly. He only went as far as the king's gate because no one in sackcloth was allowed to enter. And there was great mourning among the Jews with fasting and weeping and wailing. So this decree goes out that all the, all the Jews are going to be killed on the 13th day of the 12th month and all of their things are going to be stolen. And 
it's going out to everyone. They're telling everyone. And so when Mordecai finds out, he is weeping and wailing. And he puts on his sackcloth and ashes, which is what people did when they were like mourning in that time. When someone died, they put on sackcloth and ashes. It was showing like great distress. And so he, they weren't allowed um, in sackcloth at the king's gate. So he only goes to the king's gate, but doesn't enter. And, um, you know, there's this great, great mourning throughout all the Jews. And so Esther's attendants tell her, like, her cousin Mordecai is in distress. And so she sends, some, sends a messenger to find out why. And Mordecai tells them everything, gives them a copy of the text to show Esther and explain to her. Um, and instructed her to go to the king's presence and plead for mercy. And so she's, like, she tries to, like, get him to come talk to her. And she sends out, like royal clothes or clothes appropriate to enter the king's gates and he won't put them on he because he is in mourning and so she's like okay so they have messengers coming back and forth and so i'm so sorry and so um so, so, so Mordecai sends this message asking her to go to the king's presence and plead for mercy. And she sends a message back saying that if a man or a woman that approaches the king without being summoned, they're put to death. And so unless the king extends out the golden scepter and spares their life, like this is risking her life to do what Mordecai's asked her to do. And she says, 30 days have passed since I was called to go to the king. Like, I can't do that. Um, I'll be killed. And so Mordecai sends a message back and says, don't think because you're in the king's house, you will be spared because she's also a Jew. So he's saying like, look, you're either going to die when you go before the king and ask him to save you, or you're going to die on the 13th day of the 12th month, like the rest of us, like you have to do something. And he says, perhaps like you were put there for such a time as this which is just like such a powerful verse of scripture. Um, so yeah, he says, don't you think, don't think because you're in the king's house, you will be spared. He's reminding her, hey, you're also a Jew. Just because they don't know yet, don't think they won't find out. And don't think that you're going to be spared from this just because you're royalty now. You're a Jew and you're going to die like the rest of us. And so for this for if you remain silent at this time, relief will arise from another place, but you and your family will perish. And who knows that you have come to your royal position for such a time as this. This is already going on like 37 minutes and I apologize. And if you've hung in here this long, um, I appreciate it so much. Uh, but also you're welcome because this is the word of God and it is powerful and I'm glad that you guys are hearing it. I want to do more like sharing scripture and not just talking, you know, um, I want to teach the word of God. And so, um, I just think this is awesome. I think this is an awesome story. So if you have time, stick around for the ending, especially if you don't know it, there's also movies about this. One Night with the King. I started it the other day. I've seen it a few years ago, but I didn't remember all of it. It's not like completely biblical, but it's cool. You know, it's like a creative representation of what they assumed it could be like. But um, there's movies about the story of Esther you can watch. But it's just a really, really awesome story. So Esther sends back another message and says, Go and gather all the Jews and fast for me. Do not eat or drink for three days, day or night. And I and my attendants will fast as you do. When this is done, I will go to the king, even though it's against the law. And if I perish, I perish. Which is like one of the bravest things I've ever heard a woman say, especially in like biblical times. Like she was just such a woman of courage and just such a role model. And this is also such a foreshadowing of Jesus because Jesus says like, if you can take this cup from me, this cup of suffering, this cup of death, and please do. But if it's your will be done, I'll do it. And so this is her surrendering to God saying, not my will, but your will be done for the greater good of all these people. So such a foreshadowing of Jesus. So Mordecai goes away and carries out all of Esther's instructions to fast and pray for three days. Um, and so the same time 
that she spent fasting and sacrificing before the Lord was the same amount of time that she spent feasting and preparing for her proposal. I just thought that was interesting. So on the third day, Esther put on her royal robes and stood in the inner court of the king's palace in front of the king's hall. The king was sitting on his throne facing the entrance. And when he saw Queen Esther, he was pleased with her and held out to her the golden scepter. So he's already spared her life here. And he says, because <clears throat> he could have had her killed right there on the spot for approaching him without permission. And so he's pleased with her. She's already been given favor. And he says, what is your request? Even up to half the kingdom and it will be given to you. If it pleases the king, she says, let the king and Haman come to a banquet I have prepared for him today. Bring Haman at once, so we may do what Esther asks, says the king. And so the king and Haman went to the banquet. And as they were drinking wine, the king asked her what the petition was. And he reminds her, even up to half the kingdom will be granted. And she says, my petition and request is this. If it pleases the king, let the king and Haman come to tomorrow to the banquet I will prepare for them. Then I will answer the king's question. Haman went home boasting that he was the only person Esther had invited. But he, on his way home, he sees Mordecai and is reminded that Mordecai won't bow to him. He's not giving him honor. So he goes home and he's telling his family, you know, I'm the only one that Esther invited and blah, blah, blah. But all of this gives me no satisfaction as long as I see that Jew Mordecai sitting in the king's gate. So he is so irritated by Mordecai's presence, by him not giving him respect, by him not bowing to him, that he's being honored seemingly by the king and queen. And yet he's like, I can't even enjoy it because I hate Mordecai so much. And so his wife and friends tell him to set up a pole to have Mordecai, in, Mordecai impaled on it and ask the king the next day. So Haman does as they suggested. That night, the king could not sleep, so he ordered the book of Chronicles, the record of his reign, be brought and read to him. And it was found recorded that Mordecai had saved the king's life. The king asked, what honor has he received? Nothing has been done for him, they said. So Haman came the next day to propose impaling Mordecai on a pole. And the king said, bring him in. His evil plans were interrupted. That's just my little side note. So the king asks him, what should be done for the man the king delights to honor? And Haman, Haman, assuming that he was talking about him, said, bring a royal robe the king has worn and a horse the king has ridden on with a royal crest placed on its head and let him be led through the city streets proclaiming before him. This is what is done for the man the king delights to honor. And so the king says, go at once, Haman, get the robe and the horse and do what you suggested for Mordecai, his arch enemy, the man that he hates. The Jew who sits at the king's gate, do not neglect anything you have recommended. I think this is absolutely hilarious. So Haman does as he's commanded. And he has to bless those that he is plotted against. And he has to put him on a horse in a royal robe and shout out to everyone, this is what's done for the man that the king delights to honor. He's, he's throwing a parade for his, his arch enemy here um, because he was so prideful and he assumed that the king was talking about him. He's thinking, how would I like to be honored? And he has to do the exact same for his enemy. There's a verse that says there's a table that you've prepared for me in the presence of my enemies. Um, and I just think this is like almost the same. Like he is having to humble himself and um, parade him around declaring this is a man that the king's pleased with. And um, I just find it so funny. So... Afterwards, Mordecai returns to the king's gate, but Haman rushed home with his head covered in grief and told his wife and friends all that had happened to him. They said, since Mordecai is Jewish, you cannot stand against him. You will surely come to ruin. 
Even the enemies of God's people knew it wasn't wise to mess with God's people. And at this time, the king's servants came to take Haman to the banquet Esther had prepared. And the king asks her again, like, what do you want? Even up to half the kingdom and I will give it to you. And she says, if I have found favor with you, your majesty, and if it pleases you, grant me my life. This is my petition and spare my people. This is my request. For I and my people have been sold to be destroyed, killed, and annihilated. If we had merely been sold as slaves, I would have kept quiet because no such distress would justify disturbing the king. And the king asks, who is he? Where is he, the man that has dared do such a thing? This guy is messing with his wife, trying to kill his wife. And she points the finger across the table at this man that thinks he's being honored at this banquet for the past two days. And the king is outraged, saying, where is he? And she points at him and says, this vile Haman. And Haman becomes terrified before them. The king gets up in a rage, goes out into the palace garden, and Haman stays and pleads with Esther to save his life. Now, in this time period, him staying there when the king was not present was very disrespectful. He should have got up and followed the king out, but he knew that the king, like there was no hope with the king. The king was going to have him killed. He thought his only hope was to plead with Esther. So just as the king is returning in, Haman's falling on the couch and the king says, will he even molest the queen while she is with me in the house? He's pointing out that what he's doing is disrespectful, that he is being alone with his wife um, when he's not in, in the room. And he's like being dramatic, falling on the couch. And the king's like, you know, you're trying to kill my wife. What else will you do? He's lost all of his trust. He doesn't want him around. He is outraged. Um, and so soon, as soon as the word left the king's mouth, they covered Haman's fest. As soon as the word left the king's mouth, they covered Haman's face. And the king's attendant said, A pole reaching 50 cubits stands by Haman's house. He had it set up for Mordecai, who spoke up to help the king. The king said, Impale him on it. So they impaled Haman on the pole they had set up for Mordecai. Then the king's fury subsided. So like again, we talked about a, a verse in, Pro, in Proverbs when we started that says, if you set up a trap for others, you'll fall into it yourselves. And so here, the same pole that he set up for his enemy, he, he was impaled on himself. Um, and then, um, sorry, one second. We'll go back to the story in a second, but I just want to talk about Esther for a minute. So Esther made a practice to discipline herself, to be obedient to the authorities in her life. Um, it shows that God's timing was perfect with this whole thing. The fact that she came to royalty just before this plan to destroy the Jews. Um, Esther accepted God's will. She was confident of his providence. She was active in mobilizing her staff and others to prayer and fasting. She set an example of fasting herself. She presented herself in humility and obedience. She considered timing in her plan. She walked in wisdom. Her influence reflected extraordinary power and authority for a woman in Esther's historical setting. She wrote a decree that was entered in official records with full authority. She was courageous and self-sacrificing. She was clever, and she was used of God to save her people. I just think she's awesome. I could just go on and on and on. I love Esther. So now we are in Esther chapter 8, um, and I'm going to continue with my notes. So that same day, King Xerxes, King Xerxes gave Esther the estate of Haman, the enemy of the Jews. She was given the wealth of her enemies. Mordecai was given the signet ring that was reclaimed from Haman, and Haman was appointed over, I'm sorry, and Mordecai was appointed over Haman's estate. Um, so Esther was given the estate, and then she put Mordecai um, in charge over it. So the king allowed Esther to write another decree on behalf of the Jews and sign it with his ring. 
And so in that time, whenever the the king had signed off on like a law, there was no way to abolish the law. It had to stand. There was no way to go back on what the king had already said. So they kind of had to make a loophole law to appeal the law that was already put in place from Haman to destroy the Jews. And so this is what she does. So she writes this decree that grants the Jews the right to assemble and protect themselves to destroy, kill, and annihilate the armed men of any nationality or province that might attack them. And this is issued as law. So on the 13th day of the 12th month, they're now given permission to fight back. So on this day, everyone was declared to attack the Jews. And they, they were going to have to take it. But now there's a law in place that says they have the right to protect themselves and kill anyone who comes against them on this day. So the, hit, the city holds a celebration and many people of other nationalities actually became Jews because of the fear of the Jews. They started to realize that these people are powerful. Mordecai is promoted in the king's court. Esther is the queen. Um, and they're afraid they're not going to be able to stand against them. So they actually become Jews so they can fight with the Jews instead of against the Jews. And so the 13th day of the 12th month, no one could stand against the Jews because the people of all other nationalities were afraid of them. All the king's administrators helped the Jews because they feared Mordecai. His reputation spread and he became more and more powerful. The Jews struck down all their enemies. They killed 500 men and the 10 sons of Haman. But they did not lay hands on the plunder. Esther requested for the 10 sons of Haman to be impaled on poles and for the Jews to be able to carry out the edict tomorrow also. It was granted. The next day, the Jews put another 300 men to death, but they did not lay a hand on the plunder. The remainder of the Jews assembled to protect themselves and killed 75,000 of them, but did not lay hand on the plunder. This happened on the 13th day and the 14th day. They rested and made it a day of joy and feasting. So Purim, 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 I think it's Purim is the 14th day and the 15th day between like February and March. Um, and it celebrates the deliverance of the Jews. They rejoice with foods and gifts. So the Jews in Susa assembled on the 13th and 14th day and rested on the 15th day. That is why the rural Jews, those living in the villages, observe a day of joy and feasting and give presents to each other on the 14th day of the month. Um, Mordecai recorded these events and sent letters to all the Jews to have them celebrate the 14th and 15th day of Adar as a time when the Jews got relief from their enemies. As the, as the month when their sorrow was turned into joy and their mourning into a day of celebration, he wrote them to observe the days of feasting and joy, giving presents of food to one another and gifts to the poor. Haman had plotted to destroy the Jews, but when the plot came to the king's attention, he issued written orders that the evil scheme Haman had devised against the Jews should come back on his own head, and that he and his sons should be impaled on poles. Therefore, these days were called Purim, from the word pure. Esther's decree confirmed these regulations about Purim, and it was written down in the records, written in the book of the annals of the king of Media and Persia. Mordecai was the second in rank to King Xerxes, preeminent among the Jews and held in high esteem by his fellow Jews because he worked for the good of his people and spoke for the welfare of all Jews. So Esther and Mordecai declared that Purim would be honored on the 14th and 15th of every year by the Jews. I don't know if that's my last page of notes. That is my last page of notes. So, um, so there was this day set up that they were all supposed to be destroyed. And when came it, when Esther went to the king, he allowed her to write a decree and sign it with his signet ring. And so she issued a second decree saying that they now had the right to fight back. And because they were powerful and they feared their own lives, many people became Jews to fight with them. 
And on that day, they had victory over their enemies. Um, none of them were harmed and they destroyed all of their enemies. And so now it's celebrated um, by the Jewish people every year on certain days, the deliverance from their enemies. And so, um, you know, I just think of all of that. And if Esther did not have the bravery to stand up and to go before the king and to plead and to be obedient to Mordecai's instructions, um, none of that would have went the way that it did, but it was completely God ordained. Um, and you can just see that she's a woman of God, even though God's really not mentioned in the book at all. We know that the Jews are God's people. And this was just the fact that they were praying and fasting, you know, they're praying and fasting to God. My study Bible points out that God's not mentioned at all in the book of Esther. And it's more like a history book than anything, but, um, I see God all over it. Well, they're praying and fasting to God. They're honoring God. They're not bowing to Haman because they, they honor God. Um, I kind of disagree with that. I feel like God is all over that story. Um, and it's my absolute favorite for so many reasons, but, um, I think we can just take so much wisdom from the woman that Esther was the way that she carried herself with class and humility, the class of being able to sit at the table of your enemy, knowing that he's planning to kill you and sit silently and bite your tongue and, and feed him food. Um, for two days before announcing that he's the one trying to kill you. There's so much just self-control and patience and waiting on God's timing and following his plans and his instructions and knowing that God will fight for her and just so much faith um, that things would work out even when it had to be absolutely terrifying knowing that that she could be killed even for going to the king with this proposal. Um, and she didn't just rush to do it when she found out that that there was this plan. She didn't just rush off to the king in her own strength. She waited and she fasted and she prayed and she sought God for what to do. And I believe she followed all of that out to the T and that's why things went the way that they did because she set the example for how we should do things. When we have attacks come against our life, the first place we should go is to the Lord, not to our friends. And I'm so guilty of that to seek godly wisdom. Like she went straight to prayer and fasting and let God tell her what to do. And she followed his instructions. And that's why it was successful. I could talk about her all day, but I'm going to go ahead and end this. I hope you enjoyed it. I know it's super long. I'm going to try to get better at not take, making these take an hour. But um, that's the story of Esther. And I'd encourage you to go read it for yourself. Study it. Um, even YouTube. YouTube has like children's stories on there. You can put like... The story of Esther for kids and it'll be like a five minute summary with cartoons. Sometimes I'll like watch stuff like that with the kids and it kind of gives you a nice little refresher because they can summarize it so quickly. Whereas I don't know how to tell the story without including all the details because I think they're so necessary and important and I don't think I could share her story even if I was summarizing it in five minutes. But you can look up little things like that. And just start filling yourself with the Bible. You know, even if you just watch like a five minute cartoon clip with your kids of the story of Esther or the story of Joshua or the story of David, um, the Bible's not overwhelming. If you have to get a children's Bible and start reading it to understand it, then do it. Every time I think of the story of Esther, I am reminded of my children's Bible that my mom read to me when I was little. And that is where I learned the story. And anytime I've like taught it, I've had to go back and read it in my Bible, but I still have the images of being a child and reading my children's Bible, and that's where I learned that story. And so I just wanted to challenge you guys to dig into your Bible because the Word of God is alive and active, and it's powerful, and it can give you wisdom and insight that you can carry into your own life as well. So the things that I take from Esther is to be willing to submit to godly authority, your husband, um, your father, if you're not married, even if you are married, if you have a godly father, you can go to him for advice, godly wisdom, um, you know, your husband, God, to seek God first, to have patience and follow God's plans for your life, courage and bravery. There's just so many things in this story. Um, if there's something that stuck out to you that I didn't touch on, 
if you can comment it. I just feel like there's so much to learn here. I don't even think I've unpacked half of it, but I hope you enjoyed and I will go ahead and end this, but thank you for watching.